Welcome to the Henry George Program. I'm Mark Molino, and I'm joined by co-host Jacob Schwartz-Lucas, representing EarthSharing.org and the Robert Schalkenbach Foundation. This is a program seeking to find practical answers to the housing crisis in the Bay Area and beyond, economic volatility, poverty, and environmental degradation. More specifically, we compare and contrast the ideas of the 19th century economist Henry George with that of both historical and contemporary thinkers. We address issues ranging from artificial intelligence, automation, and universal basic income to city planning and land value tax, a concept popularized by George. Uh, just two weeks ago on the show, we had Z- on Zoltan Istvan, who ran for president on the Transhumanist Party, currently running on the Libertarian Party, who has his own libertarian take on preparing humanity for emerging technologies, uh, advocating for a basic income uh, they could possibly be paid for leasing of federal lands. Uh, this week, we're joined by James Hughes, an American sociologist and bioethicist who falls on the progressive side of the political spectrum. He is the executive director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which he founded with Nick Bostrom. He serves as associate provost for institutional research, assessment, and planning for the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Mr. Hughes asserts that the best possible technological future is achievable only by ensuring that these technologies and the wealth generated are fairly distributed. Hi, James. Welcome to the Henry George Program. Glad to be here. Great to have you. Uh, yeah, so I guess we'll, we'll start off with the idea of the basic income. And maybe before that, nuts and bolts. You hear these terms, you know, basic income, basic income guarantee, universal basic income. Uh, do you feel the distinctions between all these are uh, worth clarifying, or do you think they're not so important? Oh, I think we're getting to the point where this is a common enough uh, idea in the public discussion that we do need to start making important distinctions. I mean, just getting the ideas out there for the last 10 years was um, the, the first task. But now we're beginning to talk about what kinds of basic income, conditionality or non-conditionality, those kinds of things. I think those are important questions. And, and I guess the flavor we're talking about here is the unconditional form of the basic income. Is, is that correct to say? Yes, although, um, you know, so so you mentioned Zoltan. One of the very few things that Zoltan and I agree on is um, the desirability of a basic income. I think uh, I am on the side of um, being more open to conditionality of a basic income, having citizenship obligations as a part of a basic income, um, although whether you actually then would force people to starve if they didn't vote or something like that <laughs> is it does uh, the ro- when the rubber meets the road i'm not exactly sure how it would all work but um but there, there has been a long discussion on the left about conditionality that um i think a lot of the libertarian folks are don't want to pay attention to yeah so a lot of criticism from some folks come from uh they they're against the basic income because they feel it's it's just a handout it's giving people what isn't theirs whereas other people would say if it comes from uh basically the commonwealth what comes at all it is theirs uh, how would you how would you you know argue to either side of this about is is it a right for these people to have it or just a good thing well, maybe I should just say a word about my political trajectory. I mean, I, I started as a yippie in the 1970s, uh, briefly flirted with the far left, and then um, became a democratic socialist in college. And so uh, I've never really considered myself a Marxist, more of a post-Marxist, but in terms of an analysis of desirable political economy, I definitely believe that it's desirable for all human beings to eventually live in a world governed by basic human needs as opposed to profit. And that um, part of that goal is that we should expand the entitlements, you know, that every human being should be entitled to uh, the basic things in life and that, that, that those entitlements can continue to expand as society becomes wealthier. Um, and, uh, of course, the technological unemployment uh, issue as it's unrolling now makes that a more pointed discussion, because if wage slavery is no longer the way that majorities can find their way to abundance, then we do have to figure out how to do it in a non-wage public provision format. So, But uh, I think it's desirable to move in that direction, whether there's technological unemployment or not. I think that's that's been the goal of the left for a long time. So would you a, li- a libertarian responding who says, you know, it's it's a handout. Maybe it's you know, maybe it's uh, has a utilitarian advantage, but, you know, it's it's not really morally right. Do you think it's not just efficient, but also morally right? Or do you think it's not really a moral question? 
Well, uh, yeah, I think there are fundamental morals at stake, uh, and we all have to, and I think we should start our political discussions with fundamental philosophical questions. What is what is the good, and what is the uh, the measure of a good public policy? For me, uh, the measure of public policy should be the maximum uh, human freedom for all people. And for a libertarian, that means that everyone should have the freedom to sleep under a bridge. And for me, that means everyone should have access to health care and food and housing and uh, a, r- a roughly equal opportunity in life. And that requires, from a, from a left perspective, that requires a fair bit of redistribution and public provision. The libertarian thinks that a society of uh, contracting individuals will be able to figure all that stuff out by themselves. Yeah, so here's here's a, a quote by uh, you sometime in the past. Uh, you said, Capital flight and human capital mobility are constraints on the ability of any one country to implement redistributive policies. That's why other revenue streams, such as public ownership of public resources, should be part of the fiscal picture. Uh, so in that sense, a basic income is vitally important in disruptive new technologies. And in what degree would you say this, this public resources could be a, a key for making it possible? So a key part of my um, futurism around the question of technological unemployment is that uh, universal basic income is a desirable public policy in the face of technological unemployment but it will put increasing fiscal demands on the state. And we already live in a world dominated by austerity politics. So we really have to push back against the existing austerity politics, defend the social welfare state as it exists, and then make the argument for its expansion and reformation. Um, In the context of that, people will be increasingly unable to find work. And so demanding that the state finance itself, an increasingly generous state finance itself through uh, income taxes is going to be increasingly uh, unequitable and untenable. So we have to figure out other fiscal ways of uh, you know, doing political economy. And one of the ways to do that is to have public uh, taxation of public goods and, uh, and eventually public ownership. I think, you know, the, the, basically, public goods should be public property, and then they can be licensed. Um, uh, it's not just the taxation of the use of public goods. but um, and, and I think there's quite a, a number of dimensions, you know, the airwaves, the uh, public lands, and so forth, that, that those kinds of um, revenue sources can be maximized. Yeah, I mean, some, some uh, economists of the past, such as Henry George, have argued even in a post-scarcity world, uh, a few things will still be... Uh, in demand and still be taxable without just basically disappearing. And you say the income tax, when you know, people don't don't have any advantage to work, uh, that will that will disappear. But things that are natural, such as the frequency spectrum, such as as land and the air and water, will will always be around. Uh, I, I guess I, to to tie that back into you describing yourself as a post Marxist, uh, Marx was less interested in this and more interested in in capital, which. Uh, other folks would say is like factories, things that will become less and less important as as technology increases. Uh, do you think there's much of a distinction in your mind between how we should treat capital and how we should treat natural resources? Um, well, I, I think that there's a stronger um, intuitive argument for the private ownership of certain kinds of capital, you know, the things that people build with their own hands and so forth than for public goods. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm principally a bioethicist. Uh, you know, I, that was my uh, academic uh, orientation when I came out of graduate school. And um, in bioethics, we have this ongoing debate about the, uh, the patenting, copywriting of the human genome. It's like, you know, who, how can you make the argument that there should be any kind of private profiteering off of something that we all have inside our bodies, you know, this, this information that is a fundamental public property. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, there is a, there's a difference between that, that than something that you make. So if a, if a guy in a lab designs a novel synthetic organism, I think that person has more of a right to profit off of that uh, under existing patent law um, and uh, intuitively morally than um, patenting off of, you know, dis- discovering, in quotes, uh, a piece of the human genome. 
Yeah, so uh, it's it's actually very interesting that you uh, define uh, bioethics and biopolitics, as you put it, as, as a really primary uh, mode of, of, uh, of the political spectrum. You have not just a two political axes spectrum of social and economic, but a third, uh, biopolitics. Uh, how would you convince someone that this really is one of the predominant things that we have to uh, care about as political agents? Well, when I wrote uh, Citizen Cyborg, um, I was really, I was the executive director of the World Transhumanist Association and trying to sketch out the lay of the land as it existed back then in 2004 um, between bioconservatives of various stripes and transhumanists of various stripes. Um, and uh, it was clear, you know, the, the way I would frame it today is that the Enlightenment has many descendants um, of many different, you know, uh, orientations. There's the Scottish Enlightenment, which is more libertarian, and the French Enlightenment, which is more egalitarian. One of the things that all descendants of the Enlightenment or most share is techno optimism, a belief in progress um, and the future, and so forth. Although there are ways that Enlightenment folks end up being critical of those things as well if they run into conflict with other Enlightenment values. Um, and so what I was trying to sketch out was that I saw emerging in the politics then, and I think it's still quite plausible, um, that uh, there is a, a kind of orthogonal dimension or axis of politics to the, one, the two axes that have basically defined politics for the last century, which is the cosmopolitanism versus uh, cultural reaction you know, the, the dimensions of gender, race, religion, um, things like that, uh, and the dimension of economic redistribution, um, state uh, versus market and uh, market rights and so forth. Um, those, those two dimensions, you can basically sketch in populists and the right and libertarians and social democrats and explain most of what's happening in at least European and American politics. Um, but then you have, you know, people that I share beliefs with on left politics on everything who are adamantly opposed to my transhumanist views and people that I share all my transhumanist views who are libertarian. And so it was trying to, in that context, trying to explain what was happening around that. Now, it may be that, you know, the things will shake out so that, um, you know, transhumanism or these or techno politics or biopolitics collapses into the dimension of cultural politics. In other words, that it, you know, the if you one of the jokes that we have about you know all it takes to be a transhumanist is to not have a gag reflex, because um, if you say to someone, well, what do you think about cloning a human body without a head to use as spare parts? The transhumanist would generally say, sounds like a good idea to me, but most people would, you know, their amygdala would would throw up. So. Um, and that amygdala, that amygdalic response is basically what drives a lot of the cultural politics, you know, anti-homosexuality, uh, aversion to gender uh, perversity and so forth. Um, so it may be that it, it won't shake out the way that I was suggesting psychologically or sociologically, but, uh, but that was the hypothesis. And, and there's some evidence for it. Do you think there's two kinds of people, the ones with the gag reflex and the ones that don't? Or do you think people that are gagging now can can learn to loosen up and, and move towards the other end of the spectrum? That is a, a great question. And my current project, uh, my current book project called Cyborg Buddha is on the use of neurotechnologies to enhance moral cognition. And one of the things that's coming out of the moral uh, cognition research and the social neuroscience research is this uh, is a more kind of two kinds of people um, hypothesis that there's basically those who have strong prefrontal uh, prefrontal cortexes that are stronger than their amygdalas and can tell their amygdalas to shut up and people who can't and the people who can't are the ones who end up conservative and the people who can are the ones who end up liberal um, and there are technologies which uh, can suppress the amygdala so for instance taking propranolol which is a uh, an anti-hypertensive drug um, makes people less racist because it allows you to ignore the heart tremors you get when you see du two dudes kissing or you know a, a tall black man on the street or whatever. Um, and conversely, if you get drunk 
it suppresses your prefrontal cortex and allows your amygdala to be stronger. So there's a lot of ways in which chemicals and other neurotechnologies and kind of embodied, you know, the kind of clothing you wear and the situations you're in, the smells you smell, the the feeling of your body, whether you bathed or not, all these things are turning out to have effects on our moral cognition. So I guess there's there's one spectrum of the anti-transhumanist outlook, which is saying that, you know, it's icky. And the other side is maybe saying maybe it's rash and it will take away things that make us human. Uh, what, what was your response to, to that end of the spectrum? Well, I would frame it that there's two basic kinds of critiques of emerging technologies or transhumanism. Um, one is the it's inhuman, it's, it's frightening, it's, um, it's unnatural, those kinds of um, gut amygdala responses. The other are the ones that are more uh, pliable to public policy interrogation. So those are, it's going to make us more unequal, it's not going to be safe, it's going to exacerbate overpopulation, those kinds of questions. And those are the ones I think we can argue about. You know, I, I don't believe that overpopulation is going to be such a problem. I think the solution to inequality is egalitarian social policy, not banning technologies, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think we can have arguments about that. I don't know how to argue with people about whether something's natural or not, because they just don't accept the premise. Yeah, it's it's interesting when you talk about it, the the main political axes are are just don't go to to capture this in our own backyard here in uh, the Bay Area, Berkeley. People are self described progressives, and they're talking about implementing uh, population control because they really feel we're on the verge of a Malthusian disaster, and they really don't feel progress is is possible. So, I, I just think it's really fascinating how progressives can be so so different on kind of how they view the future. Well, it's not just progressives who are anxious about population. I mean, population control go, really goes back to white elites in the 19th century realizing that brown people and stupid people were having more uh, kids than wealthy, educated people and um, and wanting to you know, make sure that didn't happen. So there's a long history of support for population control on the right. It wasn't until the anti-abortion politics really got going in the 1970s, that um, opposition to uh, birth control and, and uh, well, you know, the Catholic Church has had a consistent position on this as a part of the right. Um, but, uh, you know, traditional Protestant Christianity wasn't mobilized around abortion or birth control until the 1970s. Yeah, to tie this back into inequality and redistribution, I think it's uh, a really interesting critique you made of the uh, the movie Gattaca, which I will admittedly, I've, I've never seen it. I was fascinated when I first saw the trailer, but I've still never seen it. Uh, the movie tends to take a, oh, it's unnatural to, to advance, uh, to enhance ourselves, and it's going to leave people behind. Uh, and... And as far as I understand, I was reading your critique, you feel people should have a right to enhance themselves, but we need to have laws that, that stop discrimination from people with different genetic uh, outcomes. Uh, how, would you, how would you describe those laws as, as working if we are, in fact, uh, unequal? Okay, so well, just to go back to Gattaca for a second, I mean, the general point is that um, science fiction in general, and especially science fiction television and film, make really poor bioethical arguments. And yet they are some of the most common intellectual doorstops that we have. You know, you, that's a Frankenstein technology. That's a, a Brave New World technology or whatever. Um, the basic argument in Gattaca is that you have a society in which uh, almost all genetic disease has been eliminated. Uh, two very misguided parents decide to play genetic roulette with their kid, end up with a kid with a, a a heart defect that's going to kill him by the time he's 30. He just wants to become an astronaut, uh, uses his wealth to defraud the federal government so that he can systematically go through the astronaut training program and die in space. And if someone actually did that today, you know, if someone had HIV and hid it from uh, NASA and got into space and was on the space station and died of HIV on the space station. I don't think anyone would be applauding them, saying how terrible it is that society doesn't allow people with HIV to become astronauts. But that's the basic argument in Gattaca. And everybody uses it as an intellectual uh, pointer to say, oh, we don't want a future where genetic disease is eliminated because all these terrible things are going to happen. What terrible things? So anyway, you know, we, did, we adopted a law back in 1997 called GINA 
that said your employer can't demand your genetic information and discriminate you uh, against you on the basis of it. There are actually legitimate reasons why employers might want to know genetic things about you, like uh, you know, if you have a genetic propensity to certain kinds of um, toxic responses and you're working around toxic chemicals or something. But we have we adopted a law that said you couldn't uh, your employer couldn't demand that of you and. Uh, and we have all kinds of situations now with algorithmic discrimination that are more pressing than genetic discrimination. Um, you know, we have algorithms. It's, you know, it's illegal to racially discriminate against people for, you know, housing loans. But uh, we have artificial intelligence programs that do a bunch of black box calculations to figure out who should get housing loans. Oh, and guess what? They figure out indirectly that someone's black and that that makes them a bad loan risk, you know. So there's all kinds of in unfairness in the kind of calculations about people in the world, and genetic information is just one. It is one of the things that we have to talk about, what kinds of genetic information are relevant and, and in what situations. Um, but you know, the, the question from a transhumanist point of view is, the future that we want to create is one in which everyone is, has access to gene therapy to get rid of their bad genes, right? The, the problem with Gattaca was that there was this one guy out of an entire society whose parents and it, you know, the other problem with Gattaca is that a lot of bad science fiction suggests we'll come up with this one technology, but we won't fix anything else. So he he grows up, he's a 30 year old man with a bad heart in a future society and they can't fix his freaking heart. You know, they have all this other <laughs> cool technology, but they can't fix his heart. Um, you know, the kind of society that we're actually going to have is one where he could easily get his heart fixed as well. And he could have gone on to be an astronaut. So the kind of society we want to create is we want all parents to have access to prenatal screening, prenatal therapy if they have bad genes so they can have their own kids and don't have to rely on third party gamete donors and adult gene therapy for tweaking their genes however they feel like when they grow up. And in that society, we will increasingly convert, converge towards a norm of gene health, which raises issues for other people. Um, but it's one in which there will be less grounds for discrimination, not more. Well, I, I guess some people have proposed a very kind of dystopian outcome where, you know, your gene outcomes make you more prone to kind of, you know, uh, irrational responses and, and, you know, jerky responses. You're more likely to assault someone in the street. You shouldn't be allowed to go out in the street. How would you how would you adjudicate something like that? Well, in the first place, genetic reductionism is. You know, like old eugenics used to argue that um, criminality was passed in the genes. And we generally understand now that that's not the case. But people worry that there's going to be a return of that kind of genetic reductionism because of behavioral genetics, showing that there are these kinds of associations of certain kinds of genes with certain kinds of cognition and so forth. And that's exactly what my project's about. There are those kinds of associations. But the future that we're going to live in is one in which once we identify that there may or may not be, you know, these marginal effects of these kinds of brain structures and brain chemistry, that you'll be able to do something about it. Right? So if you're born like, you know, ADHD, you know, there's a bell curve of brains. Some people's brains are on the end of the bell curve where they can't concentrate very well. It makes them more likely to get in trouble with the law, not do well in school, not get married, make less money die sooner, wreck their car, all kinds of things. If they take certain kinds of stimulant medications, it generally helps people not do those things. And we may have gene therapies that fix those things as well more permanently. Um, and that's true across the board in depression. Criminality is, you know, what is criminality? But, you know, there's like propensity to violence, lack of impulse control, there's all kinds of things. So the, the kind of neurotechnological future that we imagine is one in which all those things will be amenable to change to the extent that they need to be changed. And I mean, we may discover through science that, in fact, there are many social causes that are the primary causes and not the neurological ones. So I, I guess when you say we should all have the right to enhancement, this puts you in opposition with folks who feel it should be out there. And, you know, and they are kind of implicitly endorsing uh, a future class system of those who are enhanced, those are are not enhanced. Uh, well, what do you think we need to do to make sure there aren't classes of haves and have-nots as, as technology advances? Well, the first obvious thing is that we're the only country in the industrialized world that doesn't have universal health care. And, you know, um, although I miss Obama, um, Obamacare was basically 
the adoption of a program that was cooked up by the Heritage Foundation in the 1980s to fight single payer um, that said that, uh, why don't we just force everybody to pri buy private health insurance? And it's, it's basically forced everybody to buy into an, a system that costs twice as much as it should and gives us half as much as it should. So we should have universal health care. And then we would have the same debate that every country is going to have to have and will, is having. Should universal health care provision cover sex change operations? Uh, should it cover, you know, a gene therapy? Should it cover, et cetera, et cetera, all these things that we're talking about? Um, I think, you know, there are some very low-hanging fruit in the enhancement debate. One is longevity therapies, which are probably 10 years away. Um, and, you know, once we have therapies that um, significantly slow down the aging process, they will also be um, easily reconceptualized as uh, preventative treatments for cancer, heart disease, stroke, dementia, and so forth, and, you know, reduce healthcare costs overall, because the longer you put off those things, the, the better it is for society. The harder questions are going to be things like cognitive enhancement. I don't, I don't think most people have a problem with therapy. So if you have someone who has a significant cognitive deficit and you come up with a pill that brings them to the norm, um, most people would say that should be covered. Um, the problem is, well, what about the same amount of cognitive boost that you give somebody at the norm that gets them above the norm? And I think we obviously should prioritize getting people below the norm to the norm. Uh, but I think that in the end, this, you do as much good for society getting people from 100 to 120 IQ as you do from 80 to 100. I, I, I don't want to feel like I'm being a Luddite. I, I feel the one, the one anti-transhumanist you know, sci-fi story that still sticks with me, it has a world where there is opportunity for enhancement, but there's a mechanism of coercion that make opting out not really possible, and the enhancement maybe may not be that. I'm, I'm thinking the Twilight Zone episode, number 12 looks just like you. Are you familiar with that episode? I've watched all the Twilight Zone, but I don't know them by name. Which one was that? That's the one where it's a future where when girls are basically of puberty age, they ah. are enhanced, and they go into a chamber, and they come out, and they look like models, and there's one kind of you know ugly duckling girl who just doesn't want to do it. And she isn't really, you know, happy with the idea. She feels her friends go through it. They're kind of more distant. And eventually they just really kind of drill down on her. She goes through with it and she comes out and she isn't the same. She's clearly lobotomized in some way. And you have a, a society where clearly there's a coercion in that people kind of join this, this class that mostly, <laughs> you could say it makes everyone enhanced, but not necessarily better. I, I, I always worry about something like, like that. Well, at the, at the macro level, I agree, because the Institute for Ethics Emerging Technologies, we have worked since we were founded on questions of global catastrophic risk. And one of the categories of global catastrophic risk that is less rarely addressed, I mean, it's easy for people to talk about nuclear war and plague and asteroids and stuff like that. But at the level of global catastro catastrophic risk, there's also the kind of unconscious sleepwalking towards a future that we wouldn't have chosen um, and that we may all be choosing through our individual actions. And um, then an example of that would be, it may be that we are all, we all see the motivation to work more and play less, um, even though, you know, all the research would show and we would all generally vote for more leisure and less work. And um, and so we might, you know, as individuals um, collectively create the wrong kind of, you know, political economy yeah. out of our behavior. And um, and and we could do that also with drugs. I mean, the, the, that's one of the things that people worry about with stimulant medications is that people are using it to become a more productivist society as opposed to, you know, experimenting more with psychedelics or whatever. <laughs> Um, so I do worry about that. Um, but I think the flip side of it is that, uh, you know, 100, 150 years ago, you could have said the same thing about literacy. You could have said, uh, you know, there's half of the population that knows how to read. Uh, those people are going to learn how to read. They're going to um, make more money. They're going to send their kids to tutors. Their ki kids are going to tutor. It's going to create this class society between the readers and the non-readers. 
and it's going to put all this pressure on the non-readers, and the non-readers aren't going to be able to get jobs. And the problem with that argument was that reading was a fundamental good, right? Re reading, there are things which are in themselves goods, intelligence, self-control, uh, these kinds of capacities of the ability to walk, the ability to see, the ability to hear, these are fundamental goods. Um, and so if you make them generally available, most parents and most adults will choose to have them. And, uh, and we have a general consensus that public policy should maximize them. There are other things which aren't generally goods, uh, which, we may, uh, which, you know, which we may have debates about. So for instance, height. You know, uh, I'm five foot seven. I'm acutely aware that taller men get more stuff than I do in society. You generally make about $1,000 more in the United States for every inch of height as a man. Um, and uh, as a consequence, I'm sure that if there were gene therapies for height, that uh, parents would both have a moral uh, motivation to choose it for their children uh, and an aesthetic motivation because generally people want to be taller. And, um, but if everybody gets taller, nobody gets any better off, right? If, if everyone chooses eyesight over blindness, everyone's better off. But if everyone gets taller, no one's any better off. And you may have all the attendant risks of the therapy along with it. So there are some things which are intrinsic goods and others which aren't, and we have to make that distinction. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's the... That's the argument that uh, that a lot of people would make over what is going on the in the economy. A lot of ways is we're all kind of chasing the same things, and I guess you look at where our money is going. It uh, tends to be more and more towards comparative goods, goods that you compare against your neighbor, and not really uh, a good in itself. Uh, and I guess that's what some people identify as the dangers of modern economy: is we're all getting richer, we all have greater technology, but we're not actually getting more for it. We're just kind of in, in the rat race. It, exactly. And, you know, actually, I, before I got involved in uh, the techno progressive or transhumanist milieu, I was editing, I founded and edited a journal called Eco Socialist Review. And it was an attempt to articulate the dialogue. This was in the late 80s, early 90s, the dialogue between green politics and socialist politics. And, um, and I was very taken, I'm mean, also a Buddhist by background, and a Buddhist, Western Buddhists especially tend to be anti-materialist and, you know, voluntary simplicity and all that kind of stuff. And I was very taken with all of that discourse in green politics. Um, and I still think that there's an argument there, but I think there's a, an important distinction to be made between voluntary simplicity and involuntary simplicity. Uh, the goal of left politics, the goal of all, of all enlightenment politics is a, a form of, of progress in which we create general abundance. Now, I don't believe in post-scarcity because both as a Buddhist and you know, just in general, I, I think that there will always be scarcity in relationship to human wants. Uh, the only way to get rid of scarcity in that respect is to make people want less, and that's a kind of problematic prospect. Um, but we can have general abundance um, and uh, now I've lost my train of thought. But at, at any rate, uh, yeah, in a society of general abundance, I think we, we have less problems. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess, do you think a, a world of leisure, a leisure society is is possible in, in a near immediate term? Or, I mean, in our lifetimes of maybe us or our families, or do you think this is more of a long-term thing before leisure comes to all? Well, I mentioned I was a yippie in high school, and the yippies were for the 30-hour work week and a post-work society. They were some of their, um, you know, they were inheritors of the counterculture uh, arguments uh, for post-work. And I guess I've always held on to that uh, aspect of my politics. Uh, I, it, it has been more of a utopian uh, demand until recently when people began, economists began to take more seriously that this time might be different in the technological unemployment debate. You know, if you go back to uh, the Enlightenment, the late 1700s, there were people arguing that eventually technology would eliminate work. And they've are, and people, some people have argued that at some point uh, across the last 200 years, and they've always been wrong. But uh, there is, there, there are very important arguments about why this time might be different. 
Now, being post-work doesn't mean we're abundance because then there's the distributional question. If there's still wealth, but it's not distributed, it's not abundance. So um, we need to figure out the, the distributional aspect as well. But I think there, there are arguments for why this time is different. It's not just the imminence of uh, strong AI, although I do believe that we're making very rapid progress with machine learning and other kinds of artificial intelligence, which will eventually threaten all occupations. But it's also the ways in which um, the net and uh, emerging technologies um, threaten employment in other dimensions. So, for instance, 3D printing. Um, if you, you know, half of all of the economy is made up of the invention, manufacture, transportation and sale of stuff, physical stuff. And if we move towards an economy in which people, you know, without being part of any organization can invent stuff put it on the net and other people can download those blueprints and make stuff, then you've eliminated about half of the economy. And you see how much dislocation and sturm und drang we've had around uh, the movies and music industry when they faced that threat of, uh, you know, the, the copyright issues. Um, you know, how much more sturm und drang when half of the economy is threatened. Um, another example is the disintermediation of, uh, you know, the, the travel industry. You know, if you can, if everyone can either do it for themselves on Expedia, uh, you know, they, they don't have to rely on travel agents and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of ways in which technology are disrupting existing employment and also creating economies of scale so that um, fewer and fewer individuals can do more and more work. It's not, you know, it, we may not ever eliminate doctors. But if one doctor with telemedicine and artificial intelligence can monitor a thousand patients instead of 15, um, then, you know, everyone's going to go to the best doctor. My university, we're trying to figure out if we can jump into the uh, distance learning uh, economy now. But um, the, we're charging right now for each one of our distance learning courses more than Harvard down the street is charging. And if you have a choice from, you know, students all over the world about whether they want to take a distance learning course from UMass Boston or Harvard, I know who they're going to choose. So, you know, Harvard's going to have 100,000 students in their distance learning courses, and we're only going to have a handful. And, and that future for the economy meets in fewer and fewer people work in all domains. And that's that's something that that differentiates uh, Henry George and Karl Marx is uh, their focus on location. Uh, you know, f uh, you know, uh, Karl Marx explicitly said there is no location; there it only matters classes across the world. Whereas Henry George realized that as time changes, you know, how we coordinate uh, between locations matters a lot, and and prime locations can really change over time. And you see, yeah, long distance learning. This is definitely changing the scope of what is. Uh, what 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 makes something in your neighborhood really valuable? It, it can definitely change over time. Yeah, well, we mentioned earlier the difference between capital, labor, and land, which of course is central to Georgism, and um, uh, you know it's certainly central to the critique of the post scarcity utopianism that um, there's only so much beachfront property in the world, and some people are going to want it, and you know so. Basically, we have to figure out, we always have to have some mechanism for figuring out who gets the scarce stuff. Um, and I think there's also going to be scarcity in, uh, of labor and capital, but you know, increasingly the, the scarcity of capital is going to be more important than labor. Um, so, uh, but yes, absolutely. You know, I think, I have not grappled, I have to be frank, I haven't really grappled with Georgism very much in my, uh, his, my political intellectual history. And it is a really interesting set of questions. Yeah, I, I think one thing, uh, yeah, for for a person kind of being introduced to Georgism, that, that should know if there's one thing that basically, if you want to kill the Georgism's brain, just make them angrier than anything. Uh, it's it's the distinction between uh, labor and capital, uh, because to a Georgist, they would say, well, before the late 19th century. You know, David Ricardo, Adam Smith, Henry George, they didn't talk about the two factors. They talked about labor, capital. And land, uh, and basically, capital is man-made. Land is natural, and pe some people have made pretty intricate ideas of, you know, economics and, and universities have started to teach the two-factor system because it does flatter uh, the folks that made their fortunes off of being land barons and and having all these other privileges. It's a uh, it's I a pretty important distinction, and but 
just back to labor and capital, I think when, one of the reasons this time is different in the technological unemployment um, trajectory is that we already see significant signs that there's more returns, more profit returns to investments in capital than there are investments in labor. You know, if, if you, no matter what people do in our private sector economy, um, they're going to increasingly see that it makes more uh, sense to invest in software and robots. And If I might interject just for real quick, there's a, a, a refutation of uh, Thomas, Thomas Piketty's critique uh, of, of, you know, capitalism in, in the 21st century. He, uh, he was saying that capital is outpacing uh, returns to, to labor and and if you actually uh, and, and and if you actually dig into the data, like uh, the, the student at MIT who is now a professor, uh, Matt Matt Ragnelli, he argued that actually all of the gains to capital that Piketty was uh, noting were all attributable to land. Like more than eighty five percent of it was attributable to land. Yeah, I, I, to, to jump in, that is it's interesting. You should look into it if you're curious. There is an interesting uh, yeah distinction. Piketty says capital share is increasing, but if you break it up into the old distinction of capital and land, capital isn't increasing. It's only the land part which is. Which That's is, fascinating. I will have to look at that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, I guess the intuitive way to look at it is: let's imagine technology increases and increases and increases. Why shouldn't life be free? Why should you have to work and why shouldn't everything just go to basically zero? Why shouldn't everything be free? Right. Well, I have my own critiques of Star Trek, but we, we sometimes shorthand the discussion by talking about a Star Trek future in which, you know, if there was replicators and, you know, that much abundance that basically we would just have a whole new social contract and people would be motivated to do things with their lives outside of, of, of wage slavery. And, and this is often comes up in the debate, especially with libertarians, that, uh, but a lot of leftists as well, that um, people find meaning through work and it, they would all just watch TV and take drugs if they didn't have to go to a job. And I point out that there have always been, I, there, you know, most of our ancestors never worked for a wage because they were basically grown-up squirrels, and they just did the stuff that they did. But, they, but there was still uh, you know, a lot of scarcity driving their behavior. But for at least the last 10,000 years, there have been aristocrats in every society who didn't have to work for a living. And they got up, and most of them didn't uh, you know, fall on their sword or put a gun in their mouth. They found things to do with their lives. There may not be things that we appreciate today. They may have been mean people, but they, you know, they found meaning in their lives. And so I think it's, it's very ahistorical to think that the accommodation that we've made to wage slavery, and especially the women have made to wage slavery in the last 100 years, um, is somehow a fundamental part of human nature. It's not. We, we can, in a generation or two, uh, figure out new and better things to do with their lives. It's funny how those arguments over oh you know people need to work to have have a uh, you know to have meaning in their lives. You never hear that as an argument against inheritance from these folks who have have the means. You never hear it. exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I guess one one more thing to to touch on as far as you know uh, I guess privileges that some have that cause distribution. Uh, uh, you know, distributional inequalities, uh, copyright and patents. Uh, you, you've spoken a lot about, you know, ways that this could be reformed, be more fair. Uh, what would you say are the biggest things to take away from that? Well, I think if there's a general recognition that we are um, in a, a period of intellectual property overreach and, um, you know, that people are beginning to copyright mathematical equations and, you know, the first three notes of songs and all kinds of crazy stuff. And that there is a strong public goods argument for, um, you know, pushing that back. I don't think we want to get rid of the concept of intellectual property entirely. I think it can be motivating. My wife's an artist. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want people reprinting my work without my permission. You know, I, I think we all have some interest in our own intellectual um, ownership. But, uh, you know, for instance, in, in biomedicine, I think it's absolutely clear that the, um, the, the thicket of patents on human genomics um, makes it incredibly hard to do certain kinds of scientific research and, and to bring out um, uh, you know, applied genomic uh, technologies. So we, th there are very practical arguments for why um, 
scientific and technological progress is being hampered by intellectual property overreach. Yeah, some people would identify this as just pure rent-seeking in a lot of cases. The, you say patents are a trade-off between we want more research, we want more development, but we you know, need to reward people for it. Uh, there's been other proposals people have, have said to it. Uh, in, in Henry George's time, he proposed replacing a lot of, of patents with bounties, uh, which wouldn't have the rent-seeking behavior, uh, because once it's out there, everyone can share it. Other people have had new financial instruments, such as a, a tax on patents you're not using to avoid uh, rent-seeking behavior. Uh, any, any other ideas about how we should you know, look at rent-seeking? Well, the kinds of things that people talk about around genomics, for instance, is that uh, you could create the kind of public uh, property pools around genomics that, you, that people have done around, for instance, um, music and uh, the radios, that instead of you know, that you, you would pay a general fee to a company and then you'd be able to play all the music from that company and things like that. And, okay, you know, that's better, but um, I like your idea of a bounty. I mean, I don't, I think it's fundamentally offensive to logic and morality that people uh, have patented any part of the human genome or any, any part of the global genome. Anything discoverable should not be patented. But... Um, you know, if you said, no, it's not a patent, it's a, it's a bounty. You know, we'll give you a one-time payment if you discover something interesting out of the human genome. I think that's perfectly logical. Yeah, I like that. A, a lot of people on the right are very you know, keen to say, oh, the tragedy of the commons, you can't let people share. But there's things people don't talk about as much, the tragedy of the anti-commons. If you don't have anything shared, it's hard to get people started. We're all, we're all squabbling over everything at the edges. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so here's kind of a, a bigger question. Uh, inequality and the need for redistribution. Do you think this is a natural thing that that just occurs and will, you know, poverty is the way things are in a, in a natural state? Or do you think it's our own man-made systems that are to blame for, for poverty? Well, I said I was a post-Marxist and my, my principal um, post-Marxism comes from uh, a, a kind of sociological critique of the economic reductionism of Marx that I believe there are multiple forms of power in society, political power, gender power, and so forth, and that they all need their own kinds of solutions. And it's what the kids today blithely call intersectionality, but which I think there are far better ways of addressing than the kind of nonsense that they generally throw at it t in today's debate. Um, and But it, in regards you know, the way in which society reproduces inequality, I'm still pretty Marxist in that I think there is ideological hegemony of the ruling classes, that they uh, use that hegemony to create institutions, uh, cultural systems and so forth, which reproduce their power and wealth. Um, and, uh, you know, this is one of the fundamental disagreements between libertarians and people on the left is that the libertarian says, oh, we're all born free and equal men, and, uh, you know, we just have to get the state out of the way, and we could all have this wonderful utopian contractarian society. And it's like, no, not really. We're all born situated in our, you know, very specific class and, uh, you know, power positions in society. Uh, and that society is consciously, uh, you know, at the elite levels trying to reproduce that inequality and use more resources for some than others. And if you don't create countervailing institutions that redistribute the wealth and the power, you're not going to get anywhere and the, the general good will not be served. And, and in fact, you can see that societies that don't uh, ever become more equal, uh, you know, go down the road to oblivion because the, the elites in the end are parasites and, and drive society into a hole. So, you know, I think... Uh, you know, that if you have, if you share that fundamental social analysis, you think we have to have egalitarian and redistributive institutions. And I know that that's one of the places where socialists and Georgists have generally disagreed that Georgism occupies this neither left nor right, but, you know, different kind of uh, perspective. But, uh, you know, it, to, in that regard, I am I believe we can't get away from redistributive taxation and, and social provision. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you talk about the how much allies a Marxist and a Georgist can be, I think a, a Marxist critique tends to 
uh, target exactly the same things that George's critique will. Uh, different class structure, the fact that there is unearned wealth going towards the top. There is just basically privilege uh, that, that perpetuates this, uh, this, this class division. Uh, I, th- I think the main difference is uh, George's is more targeted in what ways they would try to fix it, whereas I think uh, a Marxist tends to be a bit more explicitly vague and holistic. Uh, I'm not sure if, if as a as a post Marxist, you'd agree with with that. Do you think that being targeted isn't really uh, uh, the next step after a critique of what's wrong? Well, most Marxists, uh, you know, are interested in land questions. You know, uh, land redistribution has been a part of every third world Marxist movement, and um, you know, here in Boston, uh, I. After the election, I decided to get, to throw myself back into engagement with my lifetime uh, socialist organization, the Democratic Socialists of America, which is now growing like gangbusters. And um, and so uh, here in the city, we're trying to figure out what the municipal socialist agenda was. Back 100 years ago, when municipal socialism was a big deal, it was building sewer lines and uh, uh, you know tram lines and things like that. And turns out it's pretty much the same today that you know the the governor, our Republican governor, wants to cut funding for our public transportation. Um, my university is a public institution here in the city and has always been gotten the short end of the stick in terms of state finances and is, you know, crumbling into the ground and serves a 60 percent first generation, 60 percent student of color base. So, you know, those kinds of municipal uh, socialist issues have a lot to do with land and, and property. Yeah, I mean, uh, personally speaking, I, I've I've been going to local DSA meetings myself, and I definitely feel that uh, democratic socialism and Georgism are very natural allies. Uh, I think the difference that a Georgist would say is socialization. You know, there should be smart socialism uh, as far as target the right things. It's it's better to socialize the land because there's no downsides. But if you socialize, you know, people's artwork and what they you know make with their own hands. There's definite downsides uh, if you if you socialize the wrong things or the right things, and I I really hope this is a discussion we have because I think socialism's future is dependent on it being done in a way that works and not a way that uh, that doesn't work historically. Uh, That's I just you know parenthetically I I grew up in the wake of Michael Harrington having um, borne some guilt for the divorce between the old left and the new left. Uh, be over the question of anti-anti-communism. And uh, so the idea that now DSA is dominated by millennials is, you know, delightful to me. And the fact that, you know, old farts like me get to sit in a corner in the room and, and watch 20-somethings uh, carry, uh, carry the torch is great. And we're all in the same room. But I do worry that um, they may not be learning some of the historical lessons that they're, you know, I, I'm a part on Facebook. I'm a part of the DSA uh, Dank Socialist Memes um, group, and about half of the memes that people think are funny there are memes that imply that socialists are communists. You know, uh, memes that use Stalin or Mao or whatever. And it's like for me, that's fundamentally offensive. You know, that's like saying that there's no difference between a socialist and a national socialist. You know, it's like, uh, mm. uh, so, um, you know, I think, yeah, we, we need, with this huge influx of people into the left today, uh, we do need to do some very basic political education, and there will be fights and schisms to come over that. But I'm, I'm delighted to hear that uh, Georgists are involved in DSA. We need those kind of fundamental uh, re-questioning of the old uh, truisms. Yeah, well, I think it's it's they're they're involved in so far as as they're active. I think Georgists would tend to look back at the time when the, the socialism the socialist movement in the early 20th century uh, was largely fueled by uh, people who read and loved Henry George. And I think if we're looking at a new progressive age, I think this is might be the golden time in American history. Uh, you can look back at they they had a better hero than Marx is what they'd say. There are a couple techno. Um progressives who are interested in George and I think he, actually one of my former interns Ed uh, Miller was the one who introduced me to you but um, more of the uh, kind of non-socialist left that we encounter is the technocrats um, like the the Venus project and uh, technocracy and some of these other the zeitgeist movement and those kind of people 
And that's another domain in which, um, you know, people just never understood fundamental lessons of history. It's like they, they wave their hand and they say, we can just get rid of money and do everything through planning. And it's like, yeah, but who plans it and on what grounds? And, you know, it's like, you know there's I think a lot of folks who, who come into politics just, you know, need to do a year or two of reading and thinking before they <laughs> they adopt their positions. So we have some more uh, questions uh, about sure. how this relates to George from the from the gallery. So I believe uh, Jacob has a has a question. Yeah. So um, you know, many people talk about a UBI as sort of a you know a handout, and they speak about it in a pejorative way. Um, they say that you know, people should earn um, what they get, and they shouldn't get any more than that. And um, what do you think of the statement that? The natural resources, especially land, but air, water, everything already belong to uh, people. So if, if, for instance, you're talking about a UBI, um, if you're paying for the UBI out of these natural resources, you're not um, you're not even redistributing. Right. You're not you're not stealing. You're distributing the poor. You're 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 pre-distributing. Right. You're just giving people what's already theirs. And do you think this could be a good way to sort of align the interests of the left and the right, the libertarians and, and the socialists, and kind of, you know, get past some of this, uh, you know, this roadblock ideologically? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think um, I've been delighted as I've reengaged with DSA to find that there's far less resistance to UBI than I expected. Uh, you know, I've been debating UBI with left economists for about 10 years now, and it's always been a kind of that's just capitalist propaganda to distract from the fact that right wing social policy is the cause of all the bad things in society and blah, blah, blah. And UBI will just be another way to cripple the welfare state. And you know, so there, there's a lot of left resistance in traditional policy, left policy wants circles. But on the part of, you know, the, the emerging millennial socialist movement, um, I see a lot of enthusiasm for UBI. And um, in terms of it being a handout, um, you know, your point, uh, the Alaska General Fund is one of the things we've always pointed to around the UBI movement um, as one of the most successful and indigenously American examples of, of a UBI. I mean, it's basically Alaskans decided that Alaskan oil should be Alaskans property. And if it was going to be sold, the profits should go back to Alaskans. And and uh, they all get, you know, a check for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a year. And uh, and they love it. Um, and uh, as with all universal provision, one of the dynamics of universal provision is that it creates a, its own social momentum and entitlement that becomes very hard to reverse, as opposed to means tested programs like the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. You know, Medicaid it provides about a third of the uh, reimbursement that Medicare does, and Medicare is far more politically popular. And that's because it's more it's universal in the sense that it, everyone who gets over a certain age gets it. Um, so I think the degree to which we can universalize, the degree to which we can link uh, public provision to public goods like oil and land uh, is politic makes political sense, and the degree to which we can universalize the distribution makes a lot of political sense. Yeah, and, and George would say if you can if you can make common the natural wealth of the oil in Alaska, why should we look at our enclosed commons, such as you know downtown urban real estate, the land value that goes to that? Imagine if all the like all, all the real estate uh, of the land in in Manhattan went to the people. That would be tremendous checks you could write to everybody for something that isn't going away. Manhattan's still going to be there, no matter if you socialize it or not. I agree. Absolutely. And I think that that is a part of, as I said, the municipal socialist agenda. Uh, yeah. So we are closing in on an hour. I, I think we need to be uh, wrapping up. But I, I would be remiss to uh, not focus on just how refreshing I think this view of of, of, of social justice and transhumanism, uh, as opposed to, I guess, the techno libertarianism you see around Silicon Valley. Uh, and any, any closing thoughts for folks about the dangers of going down the path of a, of a Peter Thiel and his view of what uh, what his ideal future would be? Well, Peter Peter Thiel has been a, one of my bet noirs. I, I'm not sure he even knows my name, but, um, you know, he's been one of my targets for a long time as an example of the 
ideological hegemony of the minority of techno libertarians within transhumanism. I've done uh, multiple surveys over the last 15 years of transhumanists around the world. And in the United States and around the world, the, the plurality of transhumanists are on the left, and, uh, and only a minority share the uh, minarchist or libertarian views of, of the Silicon Valley crowd. Um, but Peter Thiel is an example of, the, of, you know, you scratch one of these guys and they have no problem flipping over and supporting fascism. Um, and, uh, and that is, you know, just incredibly problematic for transhumanism as a movement. I mean, Zoltan, you know, he's basically, Zoltan's basically a performance art project, but, um, uh, you know, he had no problem like Trump, you know, he had no problem uh, saying out of one side of his mouth that he's for, you know, free public education, and UBI, and at the same time saying that he thought the solution to uh, illegal immigration was to put a chip in every immigrant who came to the United States and track them with biomonitoring. It's like, no, that sounds like fascism to me. Um, but, you know, I think we, we're at a point where futurism in general, transhumanism in particular, it's no longer tenable for us to pretend that we're all in that one big tent. We, we need to start creating the political distinctions that allow us to um, create public policy that creates the kinds of futures that we want. And we have to have some fundamental agreements. Should there be a Food and Drug Administration? Should there be universal health care? Should there be a, a you know, UBI? How generous should it be? These kinds of distinctions. So I have been distancing myself from the term transhumanism, although I still am a transhumanist and will defend, you know, that term. But um, I am pr promoting the brand of techno progressivism. And so that's the current project of the IET is to start articulating a kind of a political platform for uh, techno progressives around the world. And, and I think one of the reasons that that's important is that uh, the left has not the left has moved since World War II into an increasingly uh, uh, oppositional politics as opposed to a, a positive uh, vision of the future. And when you confront then uh, fascism that, uh, that says, you know, here's our, I'm going to uh, spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure. You know, the, the one thing that we have to thank our lucky stars for in the current political context is that Trump turned out not to be the consistent fascist that he uh, thought he was going to that we thought he was going to be because if he actually had been that kind of fascist it could have been he could have actually built a movement that would was, was incredibly dangerous um, you know if he'd actually moved for uh, infrastructure planning for uh, uh, you know uh, family leave policies and so forth the, some of the 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 nods to the left that his um, you know white nationalist advisors were were plotting um, so basically, you know, the, his supporters and the folks who uh, there's a there's a strong correlation between the folks who voted for Trump and folks of, impacted by technological unemployment in the country. Recent um, uh, study from the NBER showed that. And um, and those folks uh, also have higher rates of white um, mortality. Now they have higher rates of suicide, drug abuse, alcoholism. There's a growing amount of economic pessimism. We have to, as techno progressives, put forward a vision of the way that society can embrace emerging technologies and move forward in a positive, egalitarian direction, a direction that will be mobilizing for a new left uh, in ways that the old left was. That's the, the trillion dollar question. Who's going to get to the uh, structurally unemployed first? Is it going to be the fascist or the people who believe in injustice? Uh, but thank you for your time so much. We're in discussion with James Hughes, uh, who has been talking about the future of mankind, machines, techno, progressivism, and uh, economic justice. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.